Hey everyone, as you start moseying in, we're gonna have Berting. He is a independent security researcher. He's gonna talk to you guys about industrial protocols. It's gonna be a really fun talk. I hope you all enjoy it. And yeah, as you start moseying in, I see the camera guy has given me the okay. We'll just start kicking things off. So please give Berting a warm welcome and everyone enjoy themselves. Thanks. Okay, cool. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk. This is about, um, well, as the title says, mixing in mixing industrial protocols with uh, web application flaws in order to exploit devices in the internet, which is, I think, that I used to do all all the time for like uh, ten years ago. I mean, it's something very cra really crazy. Um, let me. That too. Okay, here we go. So, okay. Oh, why is it so fast? There it is. So fast. Okay. <coughs> okay. Hello. Uh, my name is Bertina. Uh, they present me. Uh, this is my Twitter. I'm uh, working as a security consultant, uh, professionally in network engineering, security research, device security protocol security, uh, basically all of my uh, research is based in, in remote exploitation all the time. I mean, all the things that I do is remote. And always, all the devices that I use to exploit are connected to the internet all the time. Okay, agenda for today, uh, the, mo the motivation for this research, or how it started, how I found this, uh, and how I developed the exploit and all the stuff. Uh, I'm going to be talking about modern, modern magnet devices, the security problem in those devices, and then I'm going to be explaining how to use magnet protocol itself as an attack vector for this kind of devices. Uh, the fundamentals for magnet, because in order to understand this, we need to recap all the thing about magnets, how it works, how it's designed, and, and, and all the stuff. The theory and the technique and the exploits and the conclusions. At the end, uh, there is a bonus track that I decided to include in this talk. It's an RCE and um, industrial router. Yeah, that's critical as, as usual. So the motivation about this. There is a lot of fun, a lot of fun in industrial protocol security. Usually you can uh, on off things, uh, start stuff, uh, start and stop stuff read critical data, uh, modify critical data, inject malicious data, execute malicious stuff, and so on. All these remotely from your home, from your, uh, I mean, your, your hotel room, everywhere in the world. So I start playing around with many of them, of these protocols, visible for certain changes. And some of them are invisible. That is a fun fact that many researchers uh, ignore because they think that current uh, search engines are indexing all the industrial protocols, no, but that is not true. Because uh, there are a lot of new technology, there are, new, there are a lot of new devices with proprietary protocols. And these protocols are based usually in UDP, TCP. So you can, of course, scan the internet for these uh, new protocols and uh, have some fun with them. So. Uh, please uh, keep in mind that thing that there are security, I mean there are industrial security protocols or industrial protocols that uh, are not being indexed by currency engines like Ashodan or Sumai. And people don't know that. So the following is the result of hours of reading, documentations, analyzing servers in the internet and testing on common things, trying to find out new paths for remote data in injection and web application services for specific devices using the BACnet protocol. Okay, BACnet previous research. There are a lot of thought about BACnet. I mean, in, in several talks about that you can find out uh, it's always the same thing, like uh, on, off, start, stop attacks. Uh, we know that there is no security in this protocol. It's basically plain text. Uh, there is no authentication method. Um, you can perform actually BACnet network scans remotely to the BACnet topology infrastructure. No web applications issues find, found until today. 
in this talk. I was uh, trying to figure out if someone else, years before, tried to do something that I am uh, going to show you to you today, but I had no luck. So basically, this is something new. Okay, today I am introducing a new attack vector in magnet devices. This is remote. And last night, I found another brand affected by this, curiously. So this is a travel touch thing. The, I mean, there are several brands affected by this thing, but I don't know, and we don't know exactly which they are. We need to find out. Um, you don't need tools to do this. It's just a simple script. It's a crafted attack, very, very crafted attack. It's a stealth uh, UDP base, and you can get persistence. And finally, code execution in browser, which is really cool. This thing doesn't work here. I mean, we're talking about web application, but this thing is not capable of uh, find these kind of things. So if you think that this is the thing, you are wrong. I'm gonna prove that today. So please keep in mind that this thing doesn't work here. It's not prepared yet. Okay, so brands affected by this issue discovered until now, this is a traversal issue as I mentioned. The first uh, brand is called RLE Technologies. This is a brand who manufactures devices for industrial purposes. Uh, protocol converters, industrial routers, blah, blah, blah. That Daikin, which I don't know which is the relationship with MyQuai, which is a Hong Kong company, uh, they are using the same kind of server in both uh, brands. So they have uh, one device here, another device here, and they are using the same technology, so they are affected by the same issue. Two brands uh, using the same technology. There is another brand which is not included here that I found last night, which is called KMC Control. It's affected by the same, but it was found last night, so it's uh, new. Okay, this is the, the first device that uh, I was able to exploit with this thing. Everything started here with this thing, the, the RLE protocol converter. Uh, what this, this thing does is uh, trying to, well, actually not try. Uh, he converts a uh, bagnet protocol to Modbus protocol. This is a protocol converter. When you don't have uh, a way to communicate with devices, this thing helps you to uh, modify this kind of uh, protocol conversion and you will be able to reach devices through this thing. Okay, the devices affected uh, by this issue are this one graphically, uh, Daikin and Macquay. They uh, manufacture chilling, big chilling, big chillers, chillers, that, that's it, chillers. And those devices are connected to the internet, they have a web application in order to uh, manage, configure, set up whole, the whole thing. And things are just getting bigger and bigger. Okay, uh, this is an example of a bagnet topology, how a bagnet topology is, is um, deployed in infrastructure. So our goal today is, or an attacker goal, is uh, infect the engineer web browser. Why the engineer web browser? Because he is going to be connected to these kind of devices in every time. So usually those engineers or these technicians has access to another uh, set of devices. So if we are able to uh, execute code in their machine browser, probably we could still uh, other things that could be more interesting in, in this kind of uh, particular attacks. Uh, we're talking about like an APT attack or some kind of thing, I don't know. But if you get persistent and, and the technician a machine, you could probably um, pivot to another more critical devices in that infrastructure or probably another uh, more critical computer. This, this is the idea that I have with this. Okay, this is, this is taken from the bagnet.org tutorial. Um, basically, the, the official documentation from bagnet. And there is a little note uh, about security. Because when I started this, I was, you know, interested in uh, how the security of this thing works. But I found this. So there is a little discussion of security in this presentation. We have assumed that all nodes are trusted. Security will obviously be an important future consideration. 
For now, I assume that all devices are sitting behind a firewall that does packet filtering and the environment has well implemented restrictions on the software that can run inside the firewall. This is all the thing that this guy said about bagnet security. You can find out in, in, in that link. This is all that you will have, uh, that you will find about uh, security implementations in the protocol itself. So it means that there is no authentication methods. There is nothing uh, to protect the, the protocol itself if there is no uh, firewall uh, very well implemented and infrastructure. So our goal today would be the following. A uh, remote attacker from the internet uh, has access to the device but has no access to the web application but has access to the bagnet protocol and he can read and modify things using just the protocol. So let's start with the bagnet specs. In comparison with the OSI layers, uh, the bagnet works in the application and network layer. And of course, IP. IP protocol. Is, uh, the port is 47808. Uh, it's UDP based. No complex security mechanisms, as, as I said. No CRC, no integrity checks, no hash, plain text, read write capabilities, and is completely open in the internet. You just need to perform a query in some sense engines, and you will find out that um, there are a lot of devices connect connected. Okay, uh, the bagnet structure is basically bagnet, bagnet IP. The first layer would be the VUVLC or bagnet virtual local control. <coughs> the third layer, the, the second layer would be the MPDU or network protocol data unit. And the last layer would be the application data unit, which contains all the information that we need to inject to the device. The magic happens there. Okay, let's talk about the first layer, the big no bagnet virtual link control. It's basically two bytes. Oh, excuse me, four bytes. It's four bytes. The first byte defines the type. In this case, bagnet IP, which is um, 81 and hex. The second one defines the function. In this case, uh, which function we, we would like to execute in the, in, in the communication. And the last two bytes define the length of the whole packet. So you need to sum the three layers and put the resolve in that first layer in order to create a correct uh, bagnet packet. And then send it to, to the network and get the response. If that number is not correct, uh, you will get a mold frame packet. So it's not going to work. This is a graphical representation in Wireshark about the first layer, the bagnet virtual link control. You can see the function. This is our original unicast, unicast communication. And the two bytes are the length. Then we have the bagnet network protocol data unit. This is a representation according to the bagnet wiki, but in practice, it's just two bytes, like this. So it's just telling you the version that you need to use and the control. So in this case, we set up the divide to four, which means we are expecting reply from the device. So if you don't configure this control byte, uh, you probably you could uh, you can you can get the reply back to you if it's not properly configured. So you need to read the documentation and start constructing the packet byte by byte. And the last header is the bagnet application data unit. Uh, this thing uh, is the last header and contains a uh, variable length that also should be specified in that in that header. Otherwise, you will face uh, smartphone packet issues again. This is how it looks like in Wireshark. <coughs> One important thing here is uh, the service choice. The service choice is the, the byte that allows you to uh, read or write things in the bagnet device. Okay? The magic is in the APU header that allows you to read or write values in the bagnet data structure. Okay, here's what I'm talking about the bagnet service choice. 
So you have all those values and bytes that allows you to set up how the communication is going to be executed. So in this case, we are going to be using uh, the 12 number value, which is 0C and hex, in order to read, just read, right? In order to read write, you need to set up correctly the service choice byte. At this point, probably you're, think you're taking a look into the 14 byte, because the 14 byte here allows you to uh, restart the device. If you send that byte, uh, the device will just restart. But we're not going to be talking about this today, but keep in mind that this can be possible, just sending a single packet to the network. So in order to read, it would be uh, zero Z in exa, <coughs> and for write, it would be zero F. That's it. This is how uh, a read packet looks like. You will see the read property configured there, and the number 12 in decimal. Okay, the values that we need to read and write will be the bagnet objects. A bagnet object is uh, unique in a given device. It's a combination uh, with many uh, properties. Specifically, when you create a device in a bagnet device, it means that every sensor, every IR, in, in out, output, input, output, will be created in a single device. This device has a name, and this device has uh, his own properties. Every, every sensor in the bagnet device has this uh, segmentation, like uh, specific, uh, may I compare this with uh, profiles, would be kind of a specific profile. And the property of each profile can be modified, remolding. Okay, the object identifier contains the property identifier. Basically, the string values representing unim and readable strings like location, device model, device name, and so on, in few words, or targets, or targets today. So in this case, we are reading uh, that specific object, the object identifier, which is a property identifier. It's kind of confusing, but one thing is upon the other. A property identifier has an object identifier. So if you see, uh, this is encoded as a character string. The object name, uh, the location name, application software version is character string. There are several tools available you can use uh, in order to read and write values with BagNet. There are a lot of BagNet clients. Uh, but the purpose of this thing is go deep and do this without tools in order to understand exactly how it works. Uh, you can do this with any language that supports socket communication. Okay, let's take a look how this looks like in execution. So this is an example of how our read packet should looks like uh, in a really raw way, in a really primitive way. You can see the four bytes the first layer, the BU will see, and then two bytes, the MPDU, and then the, the biggest layer, which is the APDU, which is a, a, a lot of bytes, so two, four, five, six, nine bytes, okay? So if you want to read a property identifier and an object identifier inside that thing, you need to send a packet that looks like this. You will see the, the service choice, which is 12, properly configured, and then uh, the object identifier. The object identifier is the only thing that I found as a security mechanism because you cannot read or write without that value uh, configured there. So in this case, the device is using a 3,000 uh, string, uh, excuse me, um, uh, integer in order to uh, execute uh, functions. I mean, you, can, you cannot execute something without that number specified in the packet. So for example, if you try to write values there and the value is not matching with this value of 2000 in the device, you're going to be able to, to write something. So you need to first uh, know this value in order to then uh, write properly. OK, let's take a look in the demo.
Okay, I I develop a, a tiny script in Python that perform all these things that I've been talking about. You can see the first um, the first packet will be this thing. So this thing uh, is just asking for the object identifier, and then the second packet is asking for the vendor name, uh, the software version, and so on. So it's like uh, two, seven functions. Each packet is for each function. So let's see how it works. Let's open the Wireshark in order to see the communication flow. Okay, you see there is a filter for the backnet. I'm going to execute this. And you see the communication. Correctly, I'm, um, I'm performing communication with the device remotely. This is a real device connected to the internet. And uh, I'm ask, I asking him information regarding BACnet. Specifically, I'm asking him for uh, his object identifier. You will see he, he asked me, like, uh, yeah, my object identifier is 3000. My vendor name, the firmware version, the description, the location, model name, application software, and other object name. All this information is printed here on, on in the output of my script. This is a uh, McQuay chiller, a big chiller for sure. And this is how the communication works. When you understand this, when you in practice are able to do this, you are ready to write values. But which values are interesting? I mean, what can I do with this? Uh, that was the first question when I tried to figure out found something in the protocol and the web application. Uh, at the beginning, my purpose of all this whole thing was not to find web application issues. Uh, was to figure out how to find something in the protocol itself. I mean, execute the stuff, but in the process, I found something cool, and this is the result. Okay, this is how you can uh, communicate with the devices we just with a simple script. As you can see, uh, all that I did was just read the documentation, understand how the protocol uh, works, and then uh, put it in code in just a, a, a single socket connection. You're sending raw bytes and then splitting the response in order to show uh, the plain stack data coming from the device. Okay, cool. Let's continue with the thing. Okay, let's check out the response. At this point, you will notice that the communication with the, when the device is successful, also the response back contains a specific value for the object identifier. Remember that, that, that number. Keep this value in mind because we will use it later in order to write. It's really important. Okay, now we know how to, okay. Now we know how to read the specific values from the BACnet data structure. But the cool thing is that we can modify those values. And also, the same values are being taken from the application to represent stream values, I mean, in the, in the web application front end. So this is cool. Because what if we could uh, modify these stream values for pieces of code, pieces of Java, uh, HTML or JavaScript code? In theory, this could be works or couldn't be, but at the beginning, I had no place to test this because that was just in theory. I needed a, a real device connected to the internet with this scenario uh, in order to prove that this thing works. And well, uh, I found it, and, and this is what it is. The right property is tricky. Sometimes objects are restricted to be modified, but most of the time the property value location is able to be modified from the BACnet protocol. Um, well, the, thing, the, the same thing about the device ID. Okay, in order to write, the property uh, tells you that you need mandatory uh, specific values, like the object identifier, the property identifier, and the property value that you want to modify. So let's see how we can modify stuff.
So this is a real thing. This is a real application. This is a real device. I'm a quite chiller connected to the internet. So uh, when I found this, uh, was the same impression as you. There is nothing there. I mean, it's not showing nothing. But if you right click on it and you check the source code, you will find Go. Why? Because here, first of all, there is a password. Um, let me check. Password for restart is one two three. Yeah, this is out of scope today, but was a kind of uh, nice nice thing to find. And then, if you take a look closer to this thing, you will find something really cool. Huh? What? Ah, zoom in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me see. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's take a look in the password again, the funny part. Okay, there is a password for restart, one to three. Uh, but here you cannot see any. I mean, on the main page, you won't see any. You, need, you just need to check the source code in order to find cool things. But that was not the thing that took my attention in the first place. The thing is interesting here is this, the location. The location is Las Vegas. Well, I put it this for uh, demo purposes. But here, uh, I'm going to do this with uh, this thing. This is a magnet client. And you can do this from here. And now I change the location, the value from the location, right? So if I reload this thing, see, OK, there you go. Now let's check again the source code. And you will see how the location has changed by IoT. You see, now we are in IoT village. So I did this from Bagnet uh, protocol. Uh, the device has no security. Actually, there is no access for it. But I have access to the, to the protocol itself in order to modify uh, stuff in the web application. So now this, is, this become a nice vector attack, a nice vector attack for um, HTML or JavaScript code injection. And we're not using Burp. That's the cool thing. <laughs> okay, so now we know how to write. And now let's break it down the exploit. Okay, the application is taking values from Bagnet to be represented as stream values in the web application front end. Those values can be modified from the Bagnet data structure using the Bagnet protocol write capabilities. And good theory is I replace the stream values for JavaScript code. The JavaScript code will be executed just in theory at that time. Open up the source code, check again the value of location tag in the device. And our goal will be the following. Replace this theme for JavaScript code. And the result will be an store uh, cross-site scripting in the device with application in those tags. There is no need for a special XSS payload, a single alert in a script tags is in order to trigger the cross scripting. So um, the application probably is password protected. So as you can see, actually you don't need to touch it at all. This is kind of cool because I I, I didn't did any special, I mean with the web application actually it was not touched at all. Everything comes from the bagnet. But as I said, no problem. Bagnet is available to inject code. And now we know we should place or exploit. So let's see the demo. I have a video because you know. <laughs> Uh, 
You can hear we got the same device. And first of all, read, of course. You will see the location. It's Vegas. Uh, check again the source code, as I did. You will see the tags. All this information can be modified too. Description. I mean, you have several places to put JavaScript code. That's kind of thing. But the cool thing is, as I said, the, the location value. Now let's change Vegas for a cool payload there. Okay, everything is still fine. Now let's take a look to our exploit. So our exploit would be this way. Uh, the same thing, the four bytes, uh, this, the, the two bytes for the second header, and the APDU with the biggest header, which includes our, our payload, our JavaScript payload, but encoded in hex because it's going to be sent on the network. So you just need to send that. Don't expect a reply or anything because it's UDP. And the values are going to be injected in the web application. So, okay. Now I just send the exploit. You will get the simple acknowledge reply from the device telling you that, you know, I received your packet and everything has been written, so you're good, you're good to know. If you follow the UDP flow, you will see our payloader, our script alert payloader. And, and the acknowledgement from the device is expected. So now if you reload, so there is your uh, code uh, executed in, in the web application. And it's persistent. I mean, this, this thing is going to be stored forever there. So every time that someone connects to the device, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be getting infected something. Okay, other things that you can do with this is, uh, for example, leak internal server routes. As you can see, config object input that comes from the device. So you have a path or leaks there. You can take advantage with Bagnet. And also, uh, check uh, the, the device description for each uh, profile. So for example, this was an uh, eleva elevator free machine room temperature. So you can enumerate what exactly which a specific device does in the device. So conclusions for this part, the techniques allow you to inject JavaScript without touching the web application at all. This is a JavaScript protocol based injection technique. In this particular scenario, we don't need credential or access to the web application. You just need to inject the payload and say goodbye. Several protocols are also affected by this kind of issues, but you know I cannot <laughs> um, publish everything in one in, in, in one talk. Uh, several bagnet several bagnet devices with the port 47808 are vulnerable to be modified remotely using this bagnet protocol. And the number of current devices affected is unknown, at least for me. Always there are probably new technologies affected. There are several tools to read and write. If you're sparing issues, try to, reproduce the, uh, try to reproduce the vulnerability this way. Check your packet lens or operation code. So finally, the bonus track. Uh, this is something that I found a couple of months ago. It's uh, basically uh, an RSCE vulnerability and those devices from this brand called Forfait. So Forfait is a Chinese brand of industrial devices. Uh, they manufacture a lot of stuff with um, 3G, 4G industrial routers, Zigbee, LoRa, a lot of that thing that is related to industrial stuff. And of course they have uh, devices connected to the internet. Uh, I found something really cool here. 
which is uh, an option to execute commands. At first place, you would think, okay, it's just put the command there, put a netcat inside, and probably you would, you could get a reverse shellback, but that doesn't work. So I need to figure out how to execute code there. And there is an option here, an application, this option called commands, administration commands, and you will find this. You will find this. Take a look. Okay, this box, this command shell, allows you to execute Linux commands. But as I said, if you try to execute a netcat or something like that for easy stuff, it won't work. Won't work correctly. So I had to figure out how to execute command here, commands here, and I found out uh, this payload. This payload that create like uh, the script or something, and then you will see the netcat command include here pointing to my IP and my port. So just copy that thing, paste there, copy, and run the command. Okay, here you go. And you will see the shell back to me remotely from the internet. And there you go. And also you can perform a cat, you know, the same thing as usual, ATC, password, and that's it. Well, these kind of issues are always in those kind of devices. It's the same thing all the time. Uh, it's really, really easy to spot RCEs. Um, I don't know. The thing continues. I mean, the research continues. Well, I think that is done for today. Any question or something, just let me know. This is my Twitter. If you want to follow me, I always publish in stuff related to this kind of uh, IoT stuff, OT stuff, ICS stuff. So, thank you for your time. Welcome.